So hello everyone, we're still reading Jordan Peterson, now rule number two, that is treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Jordan Peterson says it himself, so let's listen to him what he thinks rule number two is. Rule two is treat yourself as if you're someone responsible for helping, and it's sort of predicated on the idea that regardless of your inadequacies and your malevolence, which you know, I'm sure you have many inadequacies and no shortage of malevolence, just like everyone else. Regardless of that, you have a moral obligation, so that would be a responsibility, to assume that despite all evidence, that there's actually something in, of intrinsic worth about you, and that as a consequence, you're duty-bound to treat yourself like that is true. Very complicated statement. So he says there is a responsibility, a moral obligation. So responsibility for him is a moral obligation to treat yourself as someone who has value. So for me as a philosopher, it comes immediately to the question, well, okay, where does that responsibility come from? Is it an authoritarian source? Because that's usually... Um, the reason for why people do something in a certain society. Not the only reason, of course, but of course it's a strong reason if you have a lot of force, then people do it, right? So, and then you have responsibilities that you may have not chosen yourself. Now he says here that there's a responsibility against yourself. And I, I just wonder, is that true? Is that true? Do I have a responsibility uh, against myself? For example, if alcohol was bad for me, am I not allowed to drink alcohol? Or if I, um, want to, if I want to kill myself, am I not allowed to kill myself? Because you all know that someone else that we are responsible for, we probably wouldn't easily kill that person. So, and Jordan Peterson actually also has something to say about that fact. So, in particular, he discusses here the concept whether we really own ourselves, you know, all this discussion, my body, my choice, right? And he puts some doubt into the statement um, just to say, well, I, I think that women should decide about abortion, but I don't think that the my body, my choice is as easy. So, I... I don't reject immediately the criticism, but let's listen a little bit to what he sa has to say on that particular issue. You could think that in some sense you just own yourself, you know, because people do kind of make that claim, especially when they're trying to justify, for example, their right to suicide, that, you know, it's, you, it's your life, it's your body, you're yours to do what you will with. And if that was true, well, then it would seem to me that life would be a lot more straightforward because you would just tell yourself things that you would instantly obey and believe. So, first of all, you'd... Yeah, I, I really don't understand that argument. So, if I really owned my own body, then I would just tell myself what to do and then I would do it. It's a little hard to understand, but I think what he means here is that our body undergoes decisions that we have no control of. And I think, for example, um, we all know what to do in order to get, for example, a muscular body or maybe to lose weight, but we don't do it, even though it's healthier for us. And so it seems what he wants to say is, no. We don't just simply own our body, our body also owns us. That's indeed an interesting perspective. Nevertheless, I want to come back now to the lecture and wonder, okay, what then are the rules according to which we should be responsible for ourselves? Now, what I have to say is he doesn't specify the rules, he just gives like a formal advice, right? It's a bit like uh, the Kantian maxim that says you should always uh, ask whether the maxim of your action, so the principle of your action, can also be 
uh, universalized so that it could be a law that is valid for everyone. So, and the advantage of that rule is, or of that um, categorical imperative, as it is called, that it's not filled with concrete advice because conditions may be different, right? Conditions like, so for example, the golden rule that you shouldn't treat anyone in the way that you don't want to be treated does not hold. For example, if you have a very high pain tolerance, uh, you may say to other people who have a very low pain tolerance, well, don't behave like that. It's just, it's just uh, a cut or something, right? So the golden rule does not apply. Or if you are used to get insulted and it does not hurt you, it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt others, right? So therefore, Kant actually moves away from this kind of content-bound rule and tries to develop a principle according to which we can evaluate rules. And Jordan Peterson does here something very similar. He says, treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. And he does not say what that is. He has an example for that. Uh, for example, he talks about his dog. I brought a device. <laughs> so um, uh, just to make it more visual. And so it is true that we treat our dogs usually better than ourselves because, for example, when we fill, uh, when we get a prescription for drugs, uh, most people won't, or half of, what does it say, one third of them won't fill the prescription, right, if they get prescribed a certain drug, and then half of the remaining 67 will fill it, but won't take the medication correctly. However, what he says in the aftermath is that if you have a dog, then you will actually take care that the dog gets the medication and gets the medication right. And then he asks the question, what could it be about people that makes them prefer their pets over themselves? <laughs> so, right? um, so yeah, that is here the question indeed. But I think it's a bit simple. I, I don't think it's necessarily true. It's, uh, maybe not that we only have the well-being of the dog in mind. I think a lot of people also get addicted to the feeling of power and control. So, and in that sense, I see a lot of people who basically beat their dogs and who introduce rules that make no sense just in order to control the dog and turn them into a better version of them. So I think the rule itself, as it sounds to me in the first instance, is not sufficient to deliver a completed rule. It seems there has to be something else added where we say, well, treat somebody else that you're, treat yourself as somebody else that you're responsible for. And that somehow you want to treat well, but why would you want to treat that person well? Well, there comes a sense of morality in there. And the question is again, where does morality come from? And I think in the sense of Peterson so far, it sounds to me more like an external authoritarian source. I'm not yet entirely sure by it. Uh, about it. Um, but yeah, again, I wonder where is the source for Peterson's morality? I cannot locate that right now. So what I think he does is that he locates the source of that moral truth not in the scientific realm, right? It's not in the realm of fact. It's somehow more in a traditional sense laid down in the stories that we have and it's transported by the tradition. And that's why I say I suspect him to have the source of authority for morality in something external, right? And so here we have also the oldest story and the nature of the world, right? Uh, so he actually discusses about uh, stories of the creation. So, and I think having a creation myth of somebody who creates it uh, puts a certain kind of moral force into nature. And I assume this is a bit difficult. It's also pretty much what, for example, uh, Pope Benedict, the German Pope, said when he held his speech in the German Bundestag, that we should trust again the morality of nature, and nature is fundamentally created. I would say in the modern ethical position, we usually uh, state something like a, um, a certain kind of normative fallacy, and um, it's not called normative fallacy. I've forgotten what it is called. 
but it is a fallacy to conclude from a state of being to the state of how something should be or ought to be. Yeah. So, for example, just because I observe in nature that stronger animals kill weaker animals does not mean that it is a moral law uh, that also stronger humans are allowed to kill weaker humans, right? So the question of morality uh, can be beyond the state of nature. Just because we have a society uh, where men, for example, rape women, that would be a state of being, wouldn't mean that it's right to rape women. I think a lot of people agree with that. Just because many people, for example, do something or just because something exists and it's done doesn't mean it's right. However, that puts also some restrictions on our moral um, argumentation. And you see that often when people argue that, um, for example, homosexuality is natural because it also exists in the animal kingdom. That's not probably a sufficient argument for why someone is allowed to be homosexual. I believe that people should live the way they want, right? But I think it cannot be based on an observation of nature. I think, however, why the argument is often introduced is for the reason that opponents of homosexuality usually say it's not natural and then they say, well, actually you see it in nature. However, let's get back to Jordan Peterson and he actually argues here against a certain set of scientific truths that I technically don't disagree with, right? So he says uh, scientific truths were made explicit a mere 500 years ago with the work of Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton. In whatever manner, I mean, what about Aristotle? Well, Aristotle is usually rejected because he didn't work in an empirical way. So I would not say scientific truths, I would say empirical scientific truths, right? I think we had sciences a bit longer. Uh, in whatever manner our forebears viewed the world prior to that, it was not through a scientific lens any more than they could view the moon and the stars through the glass lenses of the equally recent telescope unnecessary sentence, however, because we are so scientific now and so determinately materialistic. And this is interesting. He says, okay, sciences is related to materialism. I don't think that's true. I think a complete picture of science also includes the questions of, for example, the social sciences, or as we say in Germany, the Geisteswissenschaften, yeah? um, the uh, sciences of the spirit. And that is quite reasonable because we understand that our frame of empirical observation is limited to empirical phenomena. And just an example, mathematics is not necessarily a science that deals with empirical phenomena. Mathematics usually deals with something that is somehow in our mind. For example, if we want to know why a triangle has 180 degrees as the sum of the inner angles, we usually don't walk around the world and look at triangles, right? Nevertheless, so the question is here, what does he understand to be science and materialist from a philosophical perspective, which I have studied for a very long time, I would say that's a bit of an oversimplification that I stumble over. So however, he says, okay, with regard to this materialistic mindset, it is very difficult for us even to understand that other ways of seeing can and do exist. But those who existed during the distant time in which the foundational epics of our culture emerged were more concerned with actions that dictated survival than with anything approximating what we now understand as objective truth. And yeah, I, I have a little bit of a bad feeling here because, you know, a lot of people usually argue against sciences and say, well, they don't hold the whole truth. I don't get vaccination or something, right? Um, but in a sense, it's true. Uh, if, we, if we understand the idea of truth as a truth that refers to objects, that's a very half-hearted view. And of course, German idealism has addressed that issue. And for the same, very same reason, it has its great revival right now in American philosophy. And then he says, okay, being was understood as a place of action, not a place of things. That story or drama was lived, subjective experience, as it is manifested itself moment to moment in the conscious of every living person. And yeah, then he comes to his conclusion. He says, pain matters more 
than matter matters. It is for that reason I believe that so many of the world's traditions regard the suffering attendant upon existence as the irreducible truth of being. So he uh, reinvigorates his narrative again that he has already presented to us in the introduction. It is about suffering and not about happiness. It is not about a state of things, but how we deal with the world as people who go through lived experience that is the unique, tragic uh, personal death of, for example, your father. And it is not compared to the objective death that is listed in the hospital records. A good example here, so that is basically what Jordan Peterson has in mind and which we will explore in this chapter. Yeah, so far so good. That is uh, what I have to say about Jordan the Lobster Peterson. I feel a bit annoyed by the commercials and all the interruptions in other videos where people always say, hit the like button, 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 yeah, hit the like, like button, uh, subscribe and so on. Uh, but yeah, of course, I mean, I would be happy if you subscribed or actually write me a meaningful comment that I maybe can comment myself on in one of the future videos. Um, this video is mostly done for educational purposes. I mean, it would great, be great if I could also earn money with something like that, something that I like, namely reading literature. And if you like reading literature with others together, then we can do it also for no money. And all you have to do is just follow my channel and then we are a team. Okay, I say bye-bye. Uh, the lobsters say bye-bye. This is my little lobster. Um, I take care. I feel responsibility, responsible for her and I don't beat her. Okay, bye-bye.